is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter. Okay, this morning we have just a few announcements. Uh, one great hour of sharing, special offering is uh, there's an envelope and a pamphlet to tell you all about it, but it's a very important offering. And you may put that in the special envelope in the uh, baskets on either side uh, here. Uh, please pick up your mom's or Lily's after the service that you ordered. Uh, they are right here. And in the narthex is the bread ministry. And for those of you who haven't been there before, it looks delicious. So you need to go in and pick up a, a loaf or two or some donuts or <laughs> I was looking at and uh, it looks good. And now we will stand and sing, Thine is the Glory. Oh, where did you get out of my chair?
intercession. And when you hear God in your mercy, you'll say, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need by saying, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. With joy, we pray for all Christian assemblies united this morning at the empty tomb. Help us to see you, O oh God, in those we do not expect to encounter and remove all fear from our hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With gratitude, we give you thanks for our newly baptized sisters and brothers in every land. Guide them and keep them. Open their eyes again and again to your blessings. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With humility, we pray for this planet, our home. Heal what we have scarred and broken. Renew the face of earth from north to south, from east to west, so that God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With hope and love, we pray for the nations of the world, especially those places overwhelmed by war and conflict. Bless peacemakers who work to bring justice to their country, city, village, and household. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With compassion, wipe away the tears of all who weep. Give us the spiritual tools we need to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort those who are in any trouble. Send your angels to watch over the vulnerable and sick. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear now the prayers and celebrations of this assembly. Jack and Ginny Fawcett, their 70th wedding anniversary. Austin, Nolder, and Ariel uh, have a small wedding plan for April 17th. Prayers for Ralph Hefner, Sandy Patton's daughter-in-law, daughter's father-in-law, who has very bad shingles. For Pat Hollingsworth, for upcoming surgery. For Mark Sturbank, Ann Bell's brother-in-law, with cancer. Don Samuels, friend of Freddie Steele, is in hospice. Greg Jackson's mother passed away March 23rd, part of the Dabney family. Minnie Simpson, Danny Monk's sister, passed away on March 21st. And uh, our sympathy goes out to Danny and his family. For Brenda Reynolds' friend Lila, who passed away also on March 21st, and her family. For Kinsley, Danny Monk's niece, who's four years old and has cancer throughout. Continue prayers for Nancy Martin, Kathy McAndrew, Diane Randolph, Cheryl Hoffman, and Gloria Robinson, and all those recovering from surgeries and procedures. Prayers for shut-ins Janet Bissett, Ruth Contic, Phyllis Eddy, Alberta Kelly, who will be 100 on July 22nd, Ivy Lawrence, Shirley Parrish, and Artie Richards, who's going to turn 101 this spring. Shirley Storm, Lee Wilson, Don Woodard, and Jack Fawcett. Prayers for those recovering from COVID and those who are grieving losses from COVID. Prayers for those with cancer, Dana Labrizi, Ann Voss, Chip Curran, and Natalie Jones. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With fondness, we remember those who saw our risen Lord and witnessed to his resurrection so that we might have faith. May their words and deeds inspire us to sing hallelujah again and again. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Passing from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from death to life, we commend to you gracious and ever-living God, all for whom we pray. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that the Lord has taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power 
and in glory forever. Amen. And now you may stand and say, Lord, I lift your name on high.
Thank you, choir. At this time, I'd like to take attendance. <laughs> I know. Now I can tell if you're smiling behind this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our passage today comes from the Gospel of John, John, the 20th chapter, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been used on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head, the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning is centered on the fact that Jesus, the Christ, is risen. That death was defeated. Jesus' death on the cross was not the end of him. Our eventual death is neither the end of us. For today is Resurrection Day. In celebration of this event, we have a call and response that we often say on Easter. We have already said it today. It goes like this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> today, we can easily chime in and join in in this call and response. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. 
But it was not so easy the first morning. Mary goes down to the tomb and Christ is risen is not in her mind. Mary came to grieve. It is Mary's witness of things that will mark our journey of Easter this morning. Mary had three firsts in our story that we read. Mary was first on the scene. Mary was first to tell others about what she had seen. And Mary was first to see Jesus risen. Mary was the first one on the scene, and being first on the scene says something about Mary, about her love, about her earnestness, about her devotion. Mary was also first to communicate news of the morning to other people. In fact, it was the first thing she did. News of this magnitude needs to be shared. And so she went straight to tell others, Peter and John, as a matter of fact. She went to tell others she knew would need to know. And then Mary stayed behind at the tomb when the others that she invited there left. Despite the fact that she went for reinforcements, she did not leave the scene of the crime after they had gone. And while she lingered there, it was during that window of time that she met Jesus. We will pay close attention to Mary this morning as she experiences and interprets the events of this momentous day. John tells a wonderful story of a seeking woman who was surprised by what she finds and then ultimately empowered by the one who finds her. The particular scene we are working toward is Mary's actual encounter with Jesus, which is at the end of our passage that we read and occupies only the last four verses of the 18 that we engaged. Therefore, we need to pay attention to what occurs prior to that encounter in order to be able to understand what is at stake in Jesus' disclosure to Mary and then Mary's response to Jesus. Throughout the tumultuous morning, Mary had one repeating message which reveals that what she truly thinks happened that morning. Mary's participation in the story is marked by three parallel statements about Jesus' body being taken away. Mary said, they have taken away my Lord. She first said it to the two disciples, to John and Peter, when she reached them. They have taken away my Lord, she said to them. And she repeated it also to the two angels who seemed to just appear in the tomb after John and Peter had left the scene. And then ultimately she says it to Jesus when she mistakes him for a gardener. And she specifically asks if he was the one who did it, who took the body. I wonder if Jesus thought of responding, yes, it was me, I carried myself out. I'm actually glad Jesus didn't say it that way because Jesus' actual response is so much better, and we'll talk more about that later in the sermon. Mary repeats, they have taken away my Lord. For her, Jesus' body is missing. Hence, for her, someone took him, which is perfectly logical. <laughs> which means the empty tomb does not prod Mary to faith, as it does, say, John. Remember, John saw and believed. That's what the text tells us, which is great, but we are not talking about John this morning. We're talking about Mary. Mary didn't see the empty tomb and think, Christ is risen. No, for Mary, seeing the empty tomb simply makes her worry about what has become of the corpse of the person she loves. 
I am intrigued as to whom Mary was referring to when she said they in her address. When she said they to the two disciples and again to the two angels, when she said they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Laid him. Who were they? The Jewish leaders, the Romans, Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus, random grave robbers. Who were they? Mary's anxiety and consternation are quite natural. She comes to the tomb early in the morning, perhaps for a time of private grieving, trying desperately to come to grips with the absence of the one that she loves deeply. No doubt you may personally know by now in your life that people need time to grieve. People need time to grieve. Mary comes to the tomb to grieve. I think we need to pause here for a moment because Mary has ample reason to grieve. If one jumps from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday with all without all of the mess of the middle of the week, especially Friday, you may scratch your head about her grief. Friday, what we call Good Friday, is of course all about the cross. Easter Sunday's impact is greatly reduced if we don't understand the darkness that is Friday. Friends, Mary has good reason to grieve. So Mary comes to Jesus' grave ready to do just that, ready to continue to grieve. And it strikes me as I think about Mary that the reality of grief may be at the forefront of many of you this morning. After all, this has been a hard year. Many of you have lost dear family members and friends through this pandemic or other tragedies in recent past. Many more of you grieve the social interactions we have not had in the name of safety and security. Perhaps you can resonate with how Mary comes to the tomb that morning because perhaps you also grieve. And what's more, it also strikes me that we, as followers of God, often approach God from the perspective of grief. That is our conversations with God, our, our prayers. They're often laden with grief. Grief about what is going on in our individual lives. Grief about what is going on in our communal world. In our personal lives right now, it may be the loss of someone who was close to you. That may be at the forefront of your grief this morning. Grief is pretty raw when we lose another that we love. Grief sometimes sparks memories from the recesses of our minds. Particular precious moments with another person we have lost. Late night laughter inside jokes, celebrations in victory, lessons in failure, and facing life's challenges together. And though sometimes those glimpses back are spark, they can also sometimes feel irretrievable, as if they've fallen into a gaping maw, a well that's endless, deep, and dark. It strikes me that we often approach God with grief. Grief not only in our life, but also in our world. In the recent past, we as a nation have seen hate crimes against our Asian American Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. We've seen violence against African Americans. We've seen violence against officers of the law. And we grieve for our world. Let's face it, God often gets from us 
our grief. And that is just what Mary brings this very morning over 2,000 years ago. Mary is grieving the loss of a friend and a mentor. Mary is also grieving a system that allowed, or worse, orchestrated an innocent man beaten and hung on a cross. Mary is grieving. To the very marrow of her bones, in the very cells of her body, her brain turning over thoughts, her heart continuing to pump, her lungs taking in air and out, all of these bodily miracles will go on while all else seems forever and always lost. That is grief. And the cemetery is an apt and appropriate place to grieve. But the removal of the stone and the empty tomb, well, it interrupts Mary's grieving and creates a crisis of understanding. Her mind moves logically to the conclusion that someone has taken Jesus' body. I resonate with Mary. Perhaps you do too. This is the logical conclusion. Something which cannot move itself like a dead body must be moved by some other person. Mary assumes what perhaps should be assumed, even though it is wrong. So Mary, who we are paying close attention to today, responds initially to the scene that she sees, not with faith, not with possibility, but with, could this week get any worse? I can barely deal with the crucifixion. Now Jesus' body is stolen. When Mary finds an empty tomb, she arrives at the only conclusion a person in her right mind can arrive at. Dead bodies do not simply disappear. Someone has to move them. In a world of cause and effect of established rules as to what can happen and how, in a closed structure that only allows for the old and the familiar to reoccur, Mary's logic is right on target. Find the body, wherever it has been taken. Find the body and get on with grieving. That is the way forward, or so she tells herself. After saying to Peter and John, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. After saying to the angels in the tomb, they have taken away my Lord. Mary then says to the gardener, who she just met, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Mary wants the body of Jesus. She wants to do for him what is conventional and proper. She cannot abide that the corpse has been stolen or hidden. After all, if anyone deserves a decent burial, it's Jesus. But then, just as it is all falling apart, it all comes together. Jesus changes everything for Mary with a word. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary's closed world is broken open when Jesus calls her by name. Something illogical, something impossible, something unnatural takes place. The one who was certified as dead greets her. The established rules as to what can happen and how are overthrown. The old plausibility structures are left in shambles. Mary comes face to face with resurrection. And resurrection changes everything. Jesus speaks her name. This perhaps fulfills what had been said earlier of Jesus as the shepherd. He knows his own. 
He calls them by name, and they recognize his voice. For that is exactly what happened here in the garden with Mary. Jesus calls Mary by name, and it is like day breaks in. Out of the darkness, out of the open tomb. It is Easter morning. Just like that, right in the midst of Mary's grief, light chases darkness away. Mary didn't see it coming. She was just trying to get by, trying to solve a puzzle so she could get on with grief to do what needed to be done. But Jesus changed everything. Jesus called Mary by name and her eyes were opened and reality shifted. Death is no longer the final word. Grief no longer the final act. Resurrection means life is the final word. Joy, the final act. For all of you who grieve, remember this woman, Mary. Remember this day, Easter morning. Remember our God, who shockingly can work all things together for good. Even the death of an innocent on a cross. Even the thing for which you grieve this very morning. What was once impossible is now possible. Because Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Friends, let us continue uh, our worship, repeating the Apostles' Creed in answer to the question, Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, at this time, we will have the flowering of the cross and celebrate communion. I will ask you to uh, time yourselves out and space yourselves out. It will take a little bit of time, but we have time this morning. And you'll approach the table this way. You'll collect a flower, unless you brought your own, which is fine. And then you will flower the cross. And then you'll be invited to take one of the communion cups, which uh, have uh, both the bread and the juice inside of them. And then return to your seat, and you're invited to go ahead and partake of communion. And then everybody will flow through, and at the end of that, uh, I'll close us. Um, So with that, uh, let us prepare for communion. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death, which is our life, until he comes again. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you for your wondrous love for us, a love that is profound, a love that is surprising, a love that doesn't 
bend itself to the norms of the day that goes beyond. Our God, as we witness that love that you have for us, that would take the cross and defeat it. Lord, we are humbled and we are reminded how so often in life we choose not to follow you. And so in light of your love, we take a moment of confession and we lift up to you our silent prayers of confession and we do that right now. God, thank you for your forgiveness and your restoration. And we ask that you take this bread and this cup, transform it from common use to Satan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, so space yourselves out. And but I ask you to come and to flower the cross to receive the communion cup, return to your seats, and partake of communion. Let us worship the God.
If you haven't already and you are invited to, please partake of the bread and the cup. Jesus' gift for us. And now let us stand and sing together, Jesus Christ is risen today. <clears throat>
friends, go from this place and remember this day, this Easter, this Resurrection Day. Remember that Mary comes to the grave with grief and that Jesus meets her there and can work all things. Friends, go from this place knowing that the risen Lord is in your life and makes all things possible.